Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome everyone to today's webinar, Embracing the Broken Souls of Patients Living with Life-Threatening Illness. I'm Andrew Dresco, Project Coordinator for Transforming Chaplaincy, and we are delighted you could all join us. Some housekeeping instructions off the top. This webinar is being recorded. You are listening in using your computer speaker system by default and are muted. Should you have any technical questions regarding your audio or visual, please type those into the chat box located in the platform's dashboard. You will have the opportunity to submit questions for our presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of that same dashboard. Um, you may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and we will collect these and hope to include them during a QA session at the end of today's presentation. Um, we also have some slides coming up that will promote our upcoming webinars and other educational opportunities. We do have QR codes set for those, so if you do happen to have a smartphone, you can just get that ready and click on the QR code and that will either take you into the registration page or a page that will give you further information uh, on these initiatives. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Chaba Salaji, Director of Transforming Chaplaincy. Chaba? Uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, hello, everyone. I am uh, joining for a minute to say hello and talk about a few upcoming programs. Um, first of all, let me just say I am so grateful for Marvin, Christine, and Edward for sharing their insight and expertise in this webinar. And thank you to Paul for making all this happen. Um, before I hand it over to Paul for four more introductions, I want to quickly highlight uh, three wonderful programs. Uh, for you to consider. Uh, two are from Transforming Chaplaincy and one from the George Washington University Institute for Spirituality and Health, uh, GWISH. Uh, these programs support the mission of Transforming Chaplaincy to promote evidence-based spiritual care and integrate research into professional practice. So uh, first, Andy, can you go to the RL101 slide? Thank you. So uh, the next cohort of our online research literacy 101 course uh, for Chaplain starts May 31st, uh, so you have some time uh, left to register, uh, with Paul being the instructor for that course. Um, next slide, please. Um, uh, the, we are excited to take our Chaplaincy Research Summer Institute, uh, also known as Summer Camp, to the West Coast this year. Uh, it will take place in July, and it is generously hosted by Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. And it's an awesome opportunity to connect and learn in person for a week and learn with and from other chaplains interested and involved in chaplaincy research. Uh, please apply by May 31st uh, to ensure uh, priority consideration and early bird pricing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the GWISH, uh, uh, Christine and her colleagues at GWISH have been leaders in moving interprofessional spiritual care forward. And this interprofessional spiritual care education curriculum is a two-day in-person training in DC. And it provides a unique opportunity for chaplains and non-chaplain clinician pairs from the same health system to learn how to integrate spiritual care into patient care at their organizations. And my personal experience with ISPEC is that it also creates wonderful opportunities to build connections and collaborations with other participants and faculty. Um, I've been uh, fortunate to collaborate on related projects with Christine and her team. Um, so, thank you again for joining us, and uh, with all this, I'll turn it over to Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Chava. Hi, everybody. My name is Paul. I get to serve as the convener for the Hospice Palliative Spiritual Care Research Network. There are nine of our research networks, and this is the particular network that is hosting today's, and uh, I'll have the opportunity to introduce our uh, really important speakers here in just a second. Um, Andy, next slide, please. But first, I want to shamelessly uh, invite you to join our Hospice Palliative Spiritual Care Research Network. If you're not yet a part of us, uh, we are all about what it means to connect, to inform, try to send out the latest peer-reviewed articles, and to host events just like these, featuring amazing people like Dr. Delgado Guy, Dr. Peñate, and Dr. Uh, Christina Bukowski. Next slide, please. And one way that you can do that is to just get your uh, smartphone up and join us and come in that space. And after this webinar is over, we will I'll welcome you into our space. If you haven't figured it out already, baseball is kind of a theme for me with uh, the twins, former baseman, Brian Dozier behind me and with what's in front of you. And a part, you'll see some of that in the introductions if you haven't yet been a part of our webinars previously. But thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, next slide, please, Andy. 
without further ado, it's uh, a privilege to be able to present our, our primary presenter here today, Dr. Marvin Delgado Guy. Uh, Dr. Delgado is Associate Professor um, of Palliative Rehab and Integrative Medicine at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. He is the director of the Collective Soul, Collective Soul Symposium, 12th year, I think this year. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Marvin. It's, uh, it was a fun, I got to be a part of it and it was a great event. So please consider uh, tracking that down for next year and joining us uh, for that. He's also the chair and I won't seek to pronounce this. I'm very one language kind of person, but the uh, that you are part of this really important commission for the Association of Latin American Palliative Care and that you are also the chair elect of the Latino professionals for the patients and families at Hospice of Palliative Care of the American Academy of Hospice in palliative medicine. Much more could be written. I needed a forklift to, to try to pick up that CV that you sent me, uh, Marvin. I, I'm so glad that you're here and I'm gonna turn the reins over to you in just a second, but I also wanna welcome um, Dr. Pukowski and Dr. Delgado Guy, uh, or Dr. Pinata, excuse me, I'm looking at the slide. Uh, next slide, please, Andy. Oh, I forgot, yeah, I'll go back to that one piece, the baseball part of this. I love this, by the way, Marvin, that you um, gave me this earworm, that the song that you picked, if you were a baseball player stepping up to the plate with that lumber in your hands, that you would have picked out Eye of the Tiger by a survivor. So it made me want to climb into the ring with Rocky a little bit. So that was beautiful. Thank you for that song. Next slide, please, Andy. So Dr. Bukowski will join us here shortly. Again, uh, I tried not to make this font too small. Much more could have been put onto this uh, to this slide here to introduce uh, Dr. Bukowski. She certainly gets my MVP as one of the legends in this field and so delighted to have you with us, um, Christina. So she is co-founder of this amazing, uh, or she's the founder of this organization called GWISH um, and is the executive director for the George Washington uh, University Institute for Spirituality and Health professor of medicine at George Washington University. And here's where um, this uh, iSpec that got mentioned before with uh, Chaba, that co-founded that with Dr. Betty Farrell. So this uh, interprofessional spiritual care education curriculum, it's this amazing program that Chaba talked about earlier. There's a little bit more language for it um, there in that space. And also was the um, creator of Reflection Rounds and was a part of this really important initiative to offer a peer support group for clinicians. And if you're not familiar with the FICA tool, my guess is you are. Uh, Christina is the one who created that spiritual history tool that many of us uh, use in our clinic spaces. And if uh, Dr. Bukowski were to have walked up to the plate and created a walk-up song, it would be this one next. Uh, uh, Maraconi's The Mission, uh, Gabriel's Oboe, some people call it. So if you've ever seen the movie, The Mission, it's that hauntingly beautiful song that kind of pulls us all into that really amazing place. And then uh, next slide, please. Uh, Dr. Edward Pinate is with us as well. Ed is a uh, palliative care chaplain with a section of palliative medicine and spiritual care department at Northwestern Medicine. He is a Sojourn Scholar with the Cambia Foundation. Again, congratulations, uh, add on that. Uh, and is dedicated to educating healthcare professionals in both primary and specialty level palliative care, especially in the area of spiritual care. And his research is related to testing a screening protocol related to the religious spiritual struggles. Um, some of you may be familiar with that with Dr. Fichette and uh, Jay Risk and uh, by palliative care and non-chaplain healthcare staff and how they um, use that. And his walk-up song would be a little bit more of my generation, Eminem, Lose Yourself. So. Uh, and it's so great to have you with us. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Marvin, and I'm going to go off screen. Looking forward to what you've offered us. Thank you very much, uh, Paul and um, uh, Shava. Definitely, it's a great pleasure to be here with you all. Let me just share my screen. Good. Please just let me know if you're able to see my screen. Yep. Yes. Yes, you can okay. see it. Thank you very much. So thank you uh, to Transforming Chaplaincy. is a great organization. Definitely, it's very important to get connected and continue to grow. I really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm very honored and humbled to be here with you, sharing what we do every single day, caring for our patients, especially with life-threatening illness. 
uh, with advanced and very um, terminal illness also. And um, the touch that we as a clinicians need to have um, to enter those souls and help them to walk through the process of living with this uh, illness. Um, thank you, um, Sava and Paul, for the great presentation. Also, it's a great honor for me uh, to uh, share the podium with uh, Dr. Puchalski and Dr. Peñate today that are accompanying us today. Let me just start here, very good. As we start, um, I just want you to concentrate a little bit and get some moment. Let's take a deep breath. One more time. I see you. I hear you. Help me to understand you. Allow me to journey with you. I honor the divinity within myself. I honor the divinity within you. You have worth and value. We give thanks for our life. We give thanks for our family and love. And we thanks for the ability to help people in suffering. In your many names, amen. So I don't have anything, uh, anything to, uh, any conflict of interest in or financial relationship. Uh, we will try to describe today uh, what is our role to try to um, relieve some of the spiritual suffering or spiritual pain in patients uh, living with advanced and terminal illness, especially in a multicultural and ethical environment, and try to describe some of the research health outcomes concerning spiritual distress in the clinical care setting. At the same time, uh, try to describe some of the multidisciplinary interventions even though we don't have enough time for that, um, we will try to just touch the main aspects. So as we talk about spirituality, definitely we talk about relationships. And this is important that we have to have in mind. And, uh, and I just want to share uh, one of the patients that I um, really uh, mark in my, myself in terms of um, caring for the spirits of patients who are suffering. And I call my soul is bleeding. So, um, this patient is a 60-year-old uh, with advanced malignancy, a status with multiple treatments. Unfortunately, the illness continued to progress and, um, and he continued to deteriorate. So the focus on his care was switched to his comfort and quality of life, uh, no more uh, chemotherapy or any other treatment, um, just the comfort and definitely providing the best care, especially at this time in his life. He, he was widowed. Actually, his wife died two years ago of cancer in the same place. And at the same time, um, you know, she um, he used to live with one of the daughters and he has been treated for depression with the bupropion and citalopram. Um, he, used, um, he used to have this medication at least for the last five years. Interestingly, uh, when he was admitted to our palliative care unit, um, he was complaining severe back pain with a high dose of uh, morphine uh, PCA, uh, very fatigued, poor general status um, uh, or performance status, feeling depressed mood, but not suicidal. When I sat down with him and, and, um, um, and start talking with him about his symptoms, um, I said, how are you holding up with everything that is happening to you? How's your spirit doing? He looked at me with tears in his eyes and he said, the pain is horrible. I can't stand it and I'm not at peace. I can't stand myself. I guess, I don't know, I'm just gonna die. And I'm fearful about it. We, every single day with our patients, we uh, evaluate the presence of a spiritual pain. And we say spiritual pain is defined as pain deep in your soul or in your being that is not physical. Serious nothing, pain is the worst. He had said uh, consistently that his spiritual pain was eight over 10. And, and he said to me, I, I just feel like my soul, it hurts. And I tell, the only thing I have to ask him is, can you tell me a little bit more about that, that feeling that you have with your soul? He look at me and say, I have sinned and my soul is bleeding. At that moment, as a clinician, definitely there is no point, there is no medications to give, there is no Haldol, there is no morphine, there is no Ativan, there is nothing to give more than my presence. Be silent. Be receptive, be compassionate at that moment with him and listen to him. He said, my soul is bleeding and I would just imagine that blood coming um, in his soul. Um, 
and I, after some moments, I say, what can we help to relieve that pain in your soul or that bleeding that you have in your soul? After some moments, he says, pray for me. I guess I just want to confess. I don't know. Maybe I need forgiveness. So we continue to talk and we did like a life review. Obviously, I'll continue to involve my chaplain. We, con um, we have um, the pastor to visit for sure. And uh, our counselor also was involved. And it was very interesting that the healing process continued. We were able to decrease his pain medication almost to half. And uh, his pain was much better controlled. He was able to sleep and rest better. And, uh, and he was able to connect better with, your fa with his family also. We continued definitely to uh, provide rituals that he needed to have. And uh, at the end, he was feeling much at peace. He was able to go be discharged home um, with his daughters. And uh, he actually died three weeks later in peace, surrounded by his family. The family was very grateful for that peacefulness that he was expressing. So that's the work of an interdisciplinary team for sure. And obviously, um, the fact that we as a clinician were able to connect um, in that spiritual aspect and recognize those aspects. And as we find definitely to have the quality palliative care that we provide the structure and processes of care, not only physical aspect, but psychological and psychiatric aspect and all the social aspects of care, we have to have in mind that the spiritual and religious and existential aspects of care are very important. That goes from the global, the screening, the assessment, the treatment, and obviously the ongoing care. The other important aspects also continue to make sure that we cover the cultural aspects, the care at the end of life, and everything under the ethical and legal aspects for sure. So important to remember is that our patients are not simple patients. They are very complex, not only because the age might be very young or maybe very old, multiple comorbidities with multiple symptoms, not only physical, like pain, fatigue, nausea, GI problems, dyspnea, sexual distress, uh, cognitive impairment, but also at the same time, emotional distress, like anxiety, depression, or even financial distress, all the um, family and caregiver distress in, in the social cultural issues, and obviously the spiritual, religious, and existential distress. And this does not only exist in cancer patients, but also exist in congestive heart failure patients, patients who have a very advanced COPD or chronic kidney disease, or, or dementia or AIDS patients. The important aspect is that as we have seen during the uh, last years of literature for spirituality, uh, and religiosity is that um, we need to continue to have more involvement in screening tools and assessment tools to evaluate the spirituality and the spiritual distress for patients with different um, illness, not only for cancer patients. And what we have to remember is that suffering is not a question which demands an answer. It is not a problem which requires a solution, but it's a mystery which demands a presence. And uh, people suffer in many aspects just because might be preoccupied for the future, for what they are living now, and also for the past. They might feel disconnected from themselves, from the others, from the world, for the ultimate meaning, and may, might be having some crisis of that meaning, of their own meaning of life, their own existence. And simply, they don't have the, the control of their life. They lost their independence, they feel meaningless, they might be feeling born into others and obviously hopelessness and loss of social role functioning. Like I am not the, um, the person that I used to care for you. I'm not the person that I, um, I used to um, uh, provide all the, all the food, all the money for you. I'm not the lover that I used to be. You know, I just feel emotionally relevant. So many aspects are taken in consideration when we have our patients because they might have different needs, not only informational, like not knowing where they are in their illness, what is the next step in their care, many um, needs in terms of physical, emotional, social, and definitely the spiritual aspects, you know, trying to find some hope and some meaning, some dignity, and obviously doubts about faith and religion. And we talk about connections, and obviously as we deal with a life-threatening illness, it affects the whole person in general, the physical, psychological, social, spiritual, and also sexual. And our main goal is try to transform that experience of suffering and anguish to experience of wholeness and integrity. 
but the important aspect is to have a real a balance in our own relationships, no? Because it's the patient, the family, and myself, the clinician. So, in my, and also myself, also I have my own family, my own culture, my own beliefs, my own difficulties, and obviously uh, my own meaning and happiness. At the same time, I have my uh, sympathy, empathy, and definitely compassion that's going to be helping me to con really connect with our pa with my patients and, uh, and provide that the best care that they need. And as um, with Dr. Puhaski, as in, in all the consensus conference had described, the spirituality is that dynamic and interesting aspect of humanity that refers the way that we seek and express meaning and purpose and obviously how we connect with the moment, with the sense, with the others, with the nature, or the significant or sacred. So we have this, um, this definition definitely that help us to connect with others. Also having a spiritual distress or a spiritual pain is the broken relationship with any of those connections that we might have. And people want really to talk about these aspects. We did um, this study with 100 cancer patients um, with a Gold Wish game cards that we provide 36 cards. 35 of them have one item that is a, a wish that they would like to accomplish at the end of their life. And then we ask them to pick 10, the 10 most important wishes for them. And the most interesting thing that among these 100 patients, um, most of them, in a, and among the 10 most important wishes, they asked, they wanted to have, to be at peace with God and to be able to pray. At the same time, to have my family with me, to be uh, free of pain, to be a burden to my family, to be able to trust my doctor, to keep my sense of humor, and obviously to say goodbye to important people. All those aspects are, are very important and to, to be able to help others. And if we see here, this is a spirituality, this is connections, this is the way that people really connect. And they wanted to do, um, wanted to have it and that we as a clinician be, a, be aware of these aspects. And uh, Tracy Balboni just recently published with all the team, you know, about, uh, um, you know, what has been described during the last 20 years about spirituality. And uh, with the Delphi panel uh, review, you know, we can we have identified eight main findings about the spirituality, you know, in serious illness and health. And especially that is very important in serious illness that the spiritual needs are very common in this setting, but many times are not really addressed. And that's whenever people continue to suffer. And, um, and as I say, this spiritual care is many times is, is rare to be provided to our patients. So provision with spiritual care definitely in the medical care of critical ill patients definitely is associated with better end of life outcomes. And um, for sure, unmet spiritual needs might be associated with poorer quality of life of patients. And um, this also bring the, the most important aspects about, you know, becoming more competent as a clinician, I need to become more competent to provide spiritual care of high quality. In many aspects, you know, preparing myself in, in providing that spiritual care, you know, at a level of personal, spiritual, and professional development, definitely having that ethics, ethics of uh, spiritual care, um, trying to identify definitely spiritual needs and assessment in the spiritual care interventions, working in an interdisciplinary team, in empathic and compassionate communication for sure, and obviously having everything in that inclusivity and diversity care. So that's important because if we have all these elements in our in our career in in your in our daily practice, we will have better and quality better quality relationships and communication between us and patients and caregiver, better clinical care satisfaction in all aspects, and definitely better satisfaction of our work and less compassion fatigue and less uh, burnout. out. And at the same time, we will impact the quality of spiritual care in our patients and caregiver um, with better well-being for them and quality of life, less suffering, and definitely they will benefit from the interdisciplinary approach. So it's important for us to be present in many aspects and definitely respecting the cultural um, uh, diversity that exists in, in our populations. The important aspect also just to remember is that many times we feel fearful that we um, we do not belong to the same uh, religion or spiritual or religious belief that the patient have. But what is important, it has been described in the in the 
in the research is that um, one of the most important aspects that the patients really appreciate whenever we provide spiritual care is the presence of kindness, the listening skills, and non-judgmental attitude. The listening skills, be present, you know, have that compassion present. That's one of the important aspects and um, that will really help us to continue to connect with our patients and provide that spiritual care that is needed. So it's important to have that spiritual assessment, that language that, that needs to open up, you know, channels communication for sure. You know, people, um, how to start it in, term, in general terms. I, I usually say, how are you holding up with everything? How's your spirit doing? Um, and that is start the conversation with our patients. And it's not like a kitchen recipe. It's just simply a conversation that you have it. And that's what comes with the spiritual history that Dr. Puchalski talks um, and teaches a lot. Um, questions about people might have questions about their own meaning of life, the, their own, the meaning of their illness, the meaning of their suffering, questions that we can do. Have you thought about what, what all this means? Will there be anything which you might hope, even if you are not cured? Do you attach any spiritual significance of the word hope? Other aspects, you know, people might think about their own value. How does my value relate to my independence? Is anything about me that is valuable when there are these are threatened? So people question that we can do is, are you able to hold onto a sense of your own dignity and purpose? Do you feel that people care about you as a person? People also ask themselves about relationships. Am I a strength from any family members or any friends? Who have I wronged? Am I loved? By whom? Questions that we can do is how things are with your family or with your friends. Is there anything that you need, anybody that you need to talk about it? Uh, and, or do you need to say I love you or I'm sorry? You know, and if you're a religious person, how things are between you and God? You know, this is a conversation, remember. Um, as we use the FICA to, uh, to provide, um, you know, this, to take this spiritual history, you have a spiritual belief or, that help you to walk through all this process or cope through all this process. And also what gives you meaning of life. Definitely that helps not only for people who have um, spiritual or religious <clears throat> beliefs, but also those who do not have any religious attachments. Um, are there any beliefs? And, and these beliefs are very is, are important for you. Are you part of a spiritual or religious community? And how would you like that we continue to address or help you walk through all these um, issues that you might have expressed or shared with us? So it's about connections. It's about to trying to find out those spiritual needs or spiritual distress that people might be having. No, helping overcoming fears, finding hope, finding meaning in life spiritual resources and obviously having somebody to talk about um, their meaning of life or their death. And as we have talked before, you know, the spiritual needs are, is, are very uh, prevalent in our patients and many times are not covered by us. And, uh, and interesting, people still want us as a clinicians to be able to, ex to explore those spiritual needs or spiritual distress and, uh, and have that support to them that provide that spiritual support to our patients. I always look for, the, um, it's interesting since many years ago, I started reading about the spiritual pain, especially one of the articles from Mako um, that um, talk about the loss of being and loss of relationship, that unbalance that exists because uh, it gets affected whenever I have a life-threatening illness, my, essence in my existence as a person you know it's um many uh, many definitions have come out in for several years uh, like a desolate feeling of meaningless um a self-diagnosed pain deep in your soul that is not physical uh, by Marco et al in 2006 and actually that's the one um definition that i continue to use and we use it in our daily practice in the east edmonton symptom assessment scale fs um that we added the spiritual pain that, um, um, item and, uh, and also from some of the studies that we have done. Um, many other aspects, other definitions like a sense of annihilation or impending separations, or um, life itself is painful, or an imbalance of various existential domains, or, or, or has been defined as a relationship pain resulting from existential losses, including loss of self, personal relationship, 
loss of expected satisfaction or meaning making from life, or pain caused by extinction of the being or of the meaning of itself, or self-transcendent search for a religious or, or higher source of meaning or communion with the sacred. So all those aspects are important to, and recently has been published um, one of the definitions that I, I think it, it gets um, very important and it has, it's a self-identified experience of personal discomfort or actual or potential harm triggered by a, by a threat to a person's relationship with God or higher power. That's the original definition. I will just add a potential, um, a trigger by a threat to a person's relationship with God or higher power or anything that can give them meaning in their life. So in that sense, we cover all those aspects of spirituality that are broken in terms of connections that might get connected with the spiritual pain. And as I say, you know, spiritual pain becomes really significant uh, and when it interferes with one's functionality, it prevents one from entering the transcendent spaces of the spiritual practices um, in either temporary or permanent. So also important aspects is in people who have um, connections with uh, religious aspects and uh, it's important to identify the presence of negative religious coping strategies, like a thinking like this is a God punishment, anger at God, uh, religious doubts or interpersonal religious conflict or conflict with the dogma of uh, the church or just simply self-neglect. Um, and as I say, this is the, one of the original studies about MACO that, um, that identified spiritual pain in patients admitted to the palliative care unit. And these patients were interviewed by the chaplain and um, um, patients, 96% had a spiritual pain sometime in their life and 61% had a spiritual pain at the time of the interview and the mean from 0 to 10 it was around 4.6. Um, that was very interesting and as I say it's that unbalance that exists between the awareness of death, loss of relationship, loss of self, loss of purpose, loss of control, while we started losing that internal sense of control and life affirming or transcending purposes. So as the um, spirituality definitely uh, spiritual pain is also affects my relationship with myself, you know, intrapsychic spiritual, spiritual pain or um, broken relationship with others like interpersonal spiritual pain or relationship broken with a transcendent or higher power or anything that gives us meaning. So many aspects in it can be defined in those, in those relationships. And as I say, there are several elements that might affect the presence of uh, spiritual pain that affect us um, as a person. Many aspects also have been described in terms of the, the experience of having a spiritual distress or spiritual pain, feeling dehumanized in many aspects, um, like a fragmented or self concept or disconnected from reality, or losing my autonomy, like a loss of control, not knowing what is happening, the uncertainty creates a lot of distress, a lot of spiritual distress, worries, the future, the death, accepting or versus rejecting the fate, um, losing that meaning of purpose for sure, questioning uh, my own meaning of life, my own meaning of death or suffering or illness or existence. At the same time, there have, might be so many physical manifestations like appearance, my body image changes um, in my physical symptoms or disease progression of ill treatments. Might have that strong emotions in terms of fear, anger, overwhelmed, depressed mood, and many times we think about um, it's, this is in studies have shown that the spiritual distress or spiritual pain has been highly correlated with the presence of anxiety and depression. Now, what was where, uh, what was first either anxiety or depression and then a spiritual distress or spiritual pain or vice versa. Um, we don't know exactly what is the source, but definitely they are highly connected. So it's very important to look for them. Um, whenever we find somebody who had either or um, those issues. Um, conflict with their own religion, uh, religion as we were talking, definitely um, feeling loneliness, rejected, abandoned, um, might have some communication gap, conflicts or misunderstood or stigmatization. Many aspects have been said in terms of uh, connection, peace and meaning and purpose and transcendent that give us strength spiritually, but at the same time, this can be affected also at uh, having uh, spiritual distress in many aspects, feeling guilt, lost, 
abandoned by God or feeling meaningless or, or having that um, existential suffering, like uh, the questions about why me, uh, loss of faith, many aspects can uh, happen. And this is thanks to the iceberg training wish, go um, and judge wish, um, that help us to continue to um, get more trained in these aspects. At the same time, you know, in kids, um, that's another area that we need to continue to study about the spiritual strength and spiritual struggles in, in kids, because the strength that comes from them comes from love, faith, hope, integrity, and beauty. At the same time, can be affected and develop that spiritual distress, spiritual pain, feeling loneliness, uh, despair, disappointing, meaningless, even helplessness, um, that role playing changes, uh, denial, envy, greed, uh, chaos, um, fatigue, and many other aspects. And even, you know, the caregivers definitely will continue to suffer, uh, not only the kids, but also the caregivers. So studies that we have done in 100 cancer, advanced cancer patients, we found the presence of spiritual pain more than 44%. This is um, people with the spiritual pain show with a little bit less of uh, um, expression of feeling um, consider themselves a spiritual or religious persons. And um, the other important thing is that the presence of a spiritual pain, people might not have um, too many um, uh, positive religious coping strategies. And some other studies have shown that they might have uh, more negative religious coping strategies. The other very important thing is people with a spiritual pain might have um, uh, spiritual struggles more present uh, in the meaning of life uh, might be affected and uh, the quality of life also might be affected in not only the meaning or also in the faith subscale also. Um, we, as, as, as I was telling you, is um, we do the ESAS FS, now is uh, financial uh, distress with the spiritual pain, 12 items. We do it with all our patients as a screening tool every single day whenever um, they are inpatient and also whenever they come every time to our outpatient clinic. We started in around 2015, 13, um, and um, uh, we, um, we collected this, the first uh, 292 consults um, using the ASAS FS. Um, again, it was very interesting that um, more than 40% of our patients' population showed persons of spiritual pain with a mean around four uh, over 10, and people who had the spiritual pain showed worse physical pain, worse depression, worse anxiety, worse drowsiness, and worse well-being, and even worse financial distress in many aspects. So that helped us to really identify not only the physical aspect, but also emotional and the spiritual distress that people might be having, and can help them to connect for us as a clinician, identifying these issues and address uh, you know, as a generalist, a spiritual care providers, but also being able to um, to provide the uh, referral to our chaplains um, um, colleagues, definitely in our counselors that are very important. And this is inpatient and also outpatient setting. Um, we also did it the presence of spiritual pain in the, our palliative care unit. Just this is based on the the um, chaplaincy evaluation for the presence of despair, dread, brokenness, helplessness, alienation meaningless and guilt and the presence of the spiritual distress was related to younger people uh, with worse pain, physical pain and worse depression. Recently, we presented a um, study in, uh, in the integrated uh, oncology consultations and this is uh, um, more than uh, 1,600 patients. And the interesting thing is close to 40% of this population and this goes from um, uh, early stages of illness um, to survivorship and also um, some advanced illness. And uh, still the presence of the spiritual pain was very highly prevalent. And, uh, and it was people with the spiritual pain. It was highly correlated with worse physical symptoms and emotional symptoms. And in general terms, express worse global uh, mental um, health issues and physical health issues. And even the the symptom distress in total was worse in people with a spiritual pain. So um, just um, I'm out, about to conclude, it's important that there are multiple uh, interventions, but one of the first interventions that I believe that we as a clinician need to do is really try to open the door to those spiritual aspects with our patients, because if we don't talk about these aspects with our patients, 
we won't be the patient won't have the opportunity to really express all the suffering or the reasons that they they are suffering but also we are we won't be able to open the door to our chaplaincy and our counselors to continue to help us uh, to provide the best care for these patients and I, that's what I call the collective soul, because definitely we work as a team. Everybody has their own spirituality, their own way to live their life. But at the same time, whenever we come together, we become one collective soul to relieve the suffering and improve the quality of life of our patients. So this is about collect connections. And this is about not only connection with myself, but also with the others and the, the, the transcendence with the sacred or something that gives us meaning of our life. And our main goal definitely is um, towards the healing environment, creating a culture of safety, openness, belonging, empowerment, and definitely an involvement and inclusion. And this is what I continue to invite everybody to really continue to become more competent in the spiritual care, identify these spiritual issues um, that might be happening with our patients and help them and also to connect with specialists, spiritual care specialists, but at the same time help us to to um, integrate those, the whole aspects of care in our patients. So we are all part of this collective soul. Uh, we provide inter interdisciplinary approaches, giving doubt, torture, hope, and love to decrease suffering and improve the quality of life of our patients and family, family and caregivers in distress. And I thank you for um, your comments and, um, and presence, and I'll give the, um, the podium to Paul. And let's just let me stop this. Thank you very much. Marvin, I just want to give you the, a big virtual hug and give you the highest of fives if I can, and to invite Dr. Pukalski to please uh, join us as a respondent here. Uh, and Dr. Pukalski, uh, I think, Andy, if you would kindly um, uh, upload Dr. Bukowski's slides, that would be great. Uh, I just made her presenter, is that not? No, that's great. Um, just, uh, and are you able to see um, the video? I, I have a video on this, I don't think. There you go. That's great. Thank you. That's wonderful. So how do I share my screen? Uh, I just move this over like that and I can be seen, right? Yep. And I think can... Andy uh, pulled up your slides, if that's okay. Is that okay? Yeah, I have it right here. Okay. Great. All right, cool. Thank you. So first of all, before I even start, I just really want to honor Marvin Delgado as an incredible colleague, a friend, um, and and uh, a new minted full professor, which is incredibly well deserved, Marvin. And your presentation is scholarly. It addresses both the compassion and the spirit, but also the research and the evidence. And there's so much need for that. And this notion of the collective soul is um, such an important piece because as we become more interdisciplinary, we really need to see ourselves as equal and moving forward together on behalf of the patient. So um, just really appreciated that as always, Dr. Delgado, Professor Delgado. Um, I, I just wanted to highlight a little bit the, the urgency of what Marvin has shared, that we really need to attend to spiritual distress. And while more and more people are practicing this and integrating this into their healthcare, I you know, hear people talking about doing a spiritual history or referring to chaplains, yay, that's fantastic. But I think we need to escalate this to a, a rather urgent issue because still, all too often, including in my own health setting, people People are suffering deeply and particularly given the last three plus years um, it is an urgent need that needs to be addressed and I love this quote from a marinal sister and physician who and I know um, my, my colleague chaplain Rick Bauer has shared probably this quote before but has really impacted me about our role in facing um, suffering and not running away you know horrendous suffering but we don't run away and I wanted to just you know enhance what Marvin said in this regard. So the collective soul enables us to do this. Not, not, not if any one of us alone is doing this, it would be hard. But if the whole team brings that kind of compassion, it's critical. And so addressing spiritual issues and practice of compassionate presence are really, really important. 
before I get into a little bit of how might we might address that, I just wanted to mention for those of you that are thinking about spiritual distress, in early on in my career, there was a lot of resistance in people talking about spirituality until we framed it as spiritual distress and now spiritual health as part of whole person care. Um, that, that those of us that are physicians know that we are trained to assess and plan and treat, and that's important. And so we all on the team, as Dr. Delgado often says, address spiritual distress. It's not hit a button and refer to chaplain, but we all need to do that. It's in the framework of those clinical diagnoses. So I'm just gonna focus on what's highlighted here. This just gives an outline of some of our work in education, but I really wanna focus on reflection rounds. And um, I'm just coming off a wonderful day yesterday of doing this with the Dr. Juliet Lee, who's the head of this third year surgery clerkship, and Chaplain Rick Bauer, who is the chaplain in our clinician uh, chaplain partnerships that we do in every area, including GTRR. So we did Jewish reflection rounds back in 2012, 2013, for three years, and we piloted them in medical, 18 medical schools in the US, one in Canada and showed a, a real difference in students' ability to be present, not only to themselves, but to others. And this was based on national competencies in spirituality and health education. So under compassionate presence, it's call, boundaries, deep listening, and transformation, and how they can be aware of that. So the call, we work out of service, boundaries, we don't wanna have our patients suffering get mixed into ours because then we cease to be present, but we're more likely to burn out. So training in presence is so critical, which is why we do this with clinician chaplain pairs. It's part of professional development. Uh, and we've integrated it at GW. We are integrating it even more now. We've had it as a, I do wellness in the beginning of their year, their uh, first year of medical school, but now integrating it in reflection rounds. And yesterday it was profound to hear the students talk at a very, very deep level. They shared stories. Chaplains will recognize these questions. Think of a patient you re recently cared for. Why did you pick that patient? What was special about that encounter? How were you affected emotionally, spiritually, humanistically, or in any other way? I'm giving brief comments, so I can't talk extensively about it, but it was an amazing session yesterday of how the students, these are third years, are so aware of their role in relationship to the healing of the patient, and even reflecting on things that they may have experienced, their own woundedness, and how that is part of becoming a healer a really, really exciting thing that I think is important. It is mainstream. I want to just close with uh, Dr. Elgato mentioned our ISPIC training. It's in person for the first time. Very excited. I hope if you want to come in person, it's delight, would delight me and the rest of the team. Um, it's on the 22nd, 23rd. Ideally, we would like chaplain clinician partners. We have made a few exceptions because clinicians and our chaplains may not be available, may need to cover clinical duty. We would love for you to join us. Check out, check this out on our website. And Marvin is one of our faculty and a dynamic person, as you just already heard. So thank you very much for allowing me to be here on the stage, so to speak, with Marvin and Edward. And, and thank you, Marvin, for your outstanding and inspiring presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bukowski. Um, yeah, thank you, Edward. Good to have you here. And. Uh, you want to take a whack at uh, sharing your uh, screen here we'll do that and then um, i'm stepping out of the way I look forward to what you have to offer us Ed. okay before you go away christina i just want to thank you as well for your reflections on Marvin's presentation i'm not sure if everyone can see my slide looking good Ed. yes okay sounds good and uh i also want to really uh, echo what Christina shared and thanking Marvin um, for this presentation. I want to say it was fantastic. And I also want to say thank you for the work that you have been doing for, for many years be, uh, before this presentation. I've read all your articles, and so it has been very useful for me in my role as a clinician, uh, my role as an educator, and my role also as I began testing and contributing to this effort about responding to this very real need, right? Uh, so thank you, Marvin. I, I have a few uh, reflections here as I was 
thinking about Marvin's work um, and also this presentation. And one of the things that stood out for me is that this disseminating and building the case is always ongoing work. And what I mean by that is this has not been a case as Christina has been doing this work way longer too. And as she uh, briefly mentioned that there was a lot of resistance and there's just been so much evolution and much done before, but disseminating is always ongoing. And ongoing in our various settings, ongoing globally, right? And so this made me pause and think about the ongoing effort of who do I need to communicate with me in my local setting, in my unit? Uh, for example, is it an oncology unit? Is it a palliative care team? Is it the advanced heart failure team? So it just made me think about this in terms of like who do I need to identify as stakeholders, right? My partners in clinical care, who do I need to begin sharing this information, right? This this is not new, uh, and this experience is a very real, painful experience for human beings, for our patients. And who do we need to have a conversation about, right? And it's a conversation, yes, to a moment to build awareness, but I would also say the conversation is to move forward so that we can operationalize it, right? Who do we need to talk to so that we can plan to respond to this need, right? And one of those ways of response, as both Marvin and Christina highlighted, was the, the important work of screening, right? I, before I move on to that, talking about routine screening, I, I also want to think about this not just as the local units are clinically located and covered, as, for example, if you're a chaplain, if you're a nurse, a social worker, whatever the role, but also I, I'm curious about how that would look like, what this means in terms of a system study to, to have a conversation of how we standardize. Uh, routine screening at a, at a higher level, at a next level, right? And in a similar way, ask those questions about who do we need to talk to about that at that level, right? Who are the stakeholders, right? If this, this is real, it's not an issue of, I, I think we're moving and I'm speaking in ways that we're beyond the debate if this painful is real and I'm, I'm operating from, this is a very real, experience and it's painful it's bad for humans and we need to do better very early and so my second point that i was thinking about how do we operationalize this? how do we make this routine and screening right and i was thinking about this at this national level at the united states but globally i think this looks very different very exciting we all have a different starting point of this. So, and I share one example here as Dr. Delgado in his articles and including in this uh, uh, presentation mentioned the, the very well established of the Edmonton scale, right? The ESA. And, and I love that. It, the ESA has influenced many different studies. Right. If they're not standardizing using it in a program, whether in an oncology at a heart failure unit or the palliative care unit or hospice setting, uh, if they're not using the ESET, you know, it has been influential in some way. So even though it has not been a standard use of it in daily clinical practice, I, I just am impressed how much ESET has influenced the field, right? In, in exploring these different domains questions, right? But I mention it here because I think that when I'm thinking of a different setting, maybe it's my setting, or maybe it's another Chicago setting or anywhere, and they're not using the ESAS, right? My question for me was like, so what the screening looks like for these locations as well, right? And, and I think that that's a question that's different, uh, right? They, they're all at different starting points, and I'm, I'm just so also intrigued about the curiosity of Martin's work and also uh, efforts that I'm hearing that we, we may be seeing the use of that one 
a screener question being used independently from the East as well. And that's, that's amazing, right? But I, I also think of this in a higher level to standardize as well, as I mentioned. I, I wonder how that would look as a screener if we don't use, for example, the ESAS, but I'm wondering what that screener would be because what we're aiming here is to identify that uh, for our patient population to respond, right? And this, this comes up for me. I, I also think about training. From a training perspective, I'm thinking about spiritual care training for for non-chaplain clinicians, right? Like who is screening? Training not only to use the protocol, not to only use the screener, but to offer rationale, why do we do this, right? All the elements involved in this type of training for screening for spiritual pain, right? But I'm also curious about, um, and, and so as I think of non-chaplain clinician training, I'm also thinking about uh, PPOT, um, nursing, social work, et cetera, right? But I'm also thinking about what this means for chaplain training. And like my colleagues in, in medicine and physicians or other disciplines, not all physicians have, are trained the same way, right? And very similarly, I highlight that because I think that when I look at uh, our field of spiritual care and chaplains, and this is not a place of judgment, but I highly did an observation that we're all trained very differently. And I'm wondering how this would look, what this implies for training for, for chaplains, right? Addressing spiritual pain. Thank you again for this contribution, this opportunity to this dialogue with my colleagues here. And so appreciate your work in our collaboration today. Thank you, Ed, so much. Thank you, Marvin. Um, and Christina, if you would kindly come back on as well. Marvin, I, I know we're getting close to near the top of the hour. For um, responding to uh, Dr. Bukowski, Dr. Pinate, do you have any thoughts? Again, just want to name for you in the Q&A. It's kind of exploding with how wonderful you are. So if you're levitating, I would understand perhaps why. Uh, but I, just to turn it over to your response to uh, your, your uh, interprofessional colleagues here. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Puchalski and Dr. Pinata. Definitely, it's a, it's a great opportunity, and thank you for your response. It's a, it's a highly, um, highly recognized and, uh, and important, definitely, the, the work that you have done through all these years. Um, uh, Dr. Puchalski has um, definitely um, raised up the, the bar in terms of the spiritual care, and, it's, and I believe that the spiritual training needs to be since the beginning of the whatever career we have, either we are studying for nurses, social social worker, or any anybody who's gonna go and take a look of a, uh, take care of the patients, since medic, since that school needs to get integrated the spiritual um, aspect, the knowing about that aspect, becoming more competent since the beginning rather than wait until the you know we are already pro, you know trained and professional in all these aspects. Um, so the interdisciplinary approach is definitely the most important thing in becoming more competent definitely that's that's the plus and and as you all say we are the ones who open the door you know for the spiritual care for our patients and caregivers for sure um dr Peñate had a very interesting points and i really believe that um and that's um that's one of the major important thing is that one i believe that needs we as a clinician need to continue to create the need for a spiritual uh, care for our patients, you know, showing showing that our patients are suffering not only physically but also emotional and spiritual, definitely will continue to open the door and open the eyes to the to the leadership to say, okay, yes, you know, it's really needed these aspects, and uh, and this comes with with funding and how we can cover salaries and all these aspects. But I believe that as we really show also some data and say, okay, so our population is suffering in many aspects. So the chaplains are providing this, this care that will continue to help our patients for sure. And the other important thing is that we, if we continue to become more competent in spiritual in spiritual and religiosity and in spiritual care, definitely our, um, our sense of, of, of pleasure or passion or giving you know, care for our patients will be better. We'll have most probably a little bit less of the 
compassion fatigue and less burnout now for sure um i'm totally agree that definitely there are different settings um to try to find some good screening for a spiritual distress is important and just try to look for one that helps you even for some other people might just asking about are you feeling at peace might be one of the the open up the tool but i believe that try to find a couple questions easy for the people to understand will help you to connect and identify in those people in need with the spiritual needs and definitely will help them to um for for them to create more uh, space and, and more care you know integrated care with chaplains and counselors and everybody else I know we're, we're so getting near the top here. <laughs> that was fantastic. And I feel awful that this is uh, transitioning because to bring uh, scholars and clinicians of such uh, stature as yourselves together, um, this could go on all afternoon and I and I wish it could, I, uh, but I know I need to probably transition here. And friends uh, who were able to join us, thank you so much for being a part of this. Uh, you're probably seeing a couple of things. One is a transforming chaplaincy webinar happening next week. And then uh, Edward Pinate uh, is hosting some fantastic uh you know uh bring in the um the superstars of palliative care into a space so please join edward will be hosting that he'll be one of the speakers as well uh there in late may there's the qr code and friends thank you so much dr pinate dr bukowski and dr Delgado. thank you so much for your expertise your contribution and how deeply you care for the people um living with serious illness thanks friends for joining us have a good afternoon thank you very much thank you have a good day nice seeing you everybody Bye -bye. So much. Thanks so much again, Christina. And